Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 1.15, The Mayflower Compact. Picking up from where we last left off two weeks ago, we had left our settlers hanging out as they began their journey across the Atlantic. This week, we are going to pick up with our pilgrims as they make their way across the Atlantic to their new homes. We are then going to spend much of this week focusing on what is often seen as one of the first political documents formed in the North American colonies, specifically the Mayflower Compact. The Mayflower Compact is often portrayed as this early example of the democratic ideals that will come to define the struggles of the future United States. Today, I'm going to focus on some of those early politics amongst the pilgrims. We are going to spend some time looking at the myth of the Mayflower Compact and how it is portrayed today. We are then going to look at the document itself and what it did in reality. Finally, we are going to turn back to the Mayflower Compact and try to dissect where the legend surrounding it actually comes from. So then, without further delay, let's just dive right back into our story. Every single year, thousands of American school children learn about the Mayflower, typically around Thanksgiving time. While Jamestown did precede Plymouth by some 30 years, it is the Mayflower that is often presented as being that inaugural trip to the New World. For a journey that is so central to the mythology of the United States, we know shockingly little about it. In fact, most everything that we know about the journey itself comes from William Bradford's writing. And even then, Bradford himself is surprisingly quiet on the journey. Right under the conditions on board, Bradford does make a brief mention of the combined group now aboard the Mayflower, before discussing the general health aboard the ship. There is a mention that seasickness was a constant problem, and Bradford, as always, takes the time to tell a charming tale of the special work of God's providence. I'm just going to go ahead and quote Bradford directly here, because frankly he tells the story better than I ever could. And just a note, you might notice that over the next couple of episodes, there is going to be a sharp increase in me reading quotes. This isn't really something I plan to do long term, but when it comes to Plymouth, we are lucky enough to have two excellent primary sources. We have Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation, which is what I'm about to quote from, and we also have Bradford and Edward Winslow's writing in Mort's Relations. So, as I said, don't be shocked when you start hearing an increasing number of quotes from me. I don't think this is going to be a long-term kind of deal, but let's use what we've got. Okay, returning to William Bradford talking about conditions on the Mayflower, he says, There was a proud and very profane young man, one of the seamen, a lusty able body which made him all the more haunty. He would always be commenting on the poor people in their sickness, cursing them daily with grievous exhortations, and did not let to tell them that he hoped to help cast half of them overboard before they came to their journey's end, and to make merry with what they had, and if they were gently reproved, he would curse and swear most bitterly. But it pleased God before they came half seas over to smite this young man with a grievous disease, of which he died in a desperate manner, and so was himself the first who was thrown overboard. Thus his curses light on his own head, and it was an astonishment to all his fellows, for they noted it, it had to be the just hand of God upon him. So yeah, that's a pretty uplifting story. I bring it up for a couple of reasons. First, it does give some insight into the state of things aboard the Mayflower. It clues us in that there was some amount of disease on board and that death was an actual risk. It's also a good insight into the group itself and gives a working idea of the inner thoughts of Bradford. All in all, it gives us at least some picture of life and the tensions aboard the Mayflower. Beyond just some joyous talk of the ship's leading jerk getting sick, dying, and being thrown overboard, Bradford would also write about what you would probably expect. There is a lot of talk about the dangerous crosswinds, seasickness, and the general misery that existed on board. Bradford routinely writes about how the settlers survived and kept going forward in the name of God. It is interesting to note that, for the most part, there isn't much talk about widespread death and disease. So, while we know that at least one guy did succumb to illness, and it is probably not out of the question that the conditions on board were less than sanitary, there does not really seem to be a widespread dying. Beyond that, however, there really isn't a ton that we know about the journey itself. Bradford spends only two pages writing about the Mayflower. However, through him, we do get an idea of those conditions. On November 9, 1620, the Mayflower encountered Cape Cod. Cape Cod was not an unknown place upon its discovery. John Smith had found it and named it Cape James. However, by the time the Pilgrims got there, the Cape Cod name was pretty much accepted. 
Fishermen had named the area for the large number of cod and the valuable fishing waters right off the coast. The journey in full had taken 65 days and had landed the pilgrims just in time to face a potential New England winter. The first problem that the pilgrims had upon arriving is that they were in the wrong place. Now, originally, they had planned to set up camp closer to the mouth of the Hudson. However, they were a ways north of that. In fact, the settlers were moving towards the Hudson because they didn't actually hold a patent to settle the land in Cape Cod. The ship's captain, Christopher Jones, recognizing this fact, did attempt to make his way south to the mouth of the Hudson, where they were supposed to be. However, with the conditions of the passengers now declining, dangerous and uncharted shores, and an uncooperative wind, Jones made the call to return and settle Cape Cod. To say that the settlers were upset about this decision would be an understatement. This entire experience began to show a serious divide between the pilgrims. As discussed previously, the group from Leiden only made up about half of the new settlers. The other half was a mixed group of strangers who were coming to the New World for their own reasons. The group of strangers, or people not from the Leiden congregation, included people such as Christopher Jones. Also among them was Stephen Hopkins, who had a reputation for being constantly problematic. Therefore, factionalism began to pose a serious concern for the passengers aboard the Mayflower. Now, going back for a moment, one of the biggest concerns was what I had just mentioned a moment ago. The colonists were no longer going to settle the land near the mouth of the Hudson, but rather were moving back towards Cape Cod. The pattern that they had to settle the land specifically had designated the land that they were allowed to settle, and Cape Cod was not part of it. This means that the pattern that they were operating under had, in their eyes, become void. Understanding that the survival of the colony required some kind of a general charter, the decision was made to form a compact between the passengers on board the Mayflower that would control how the colony would function. The thought was that this would also grant the colonists the legitimacy that they needed to operate in the absence of an official royal patent. The Mayflower Compact is one of those things that is part of the mythology of the United States. This is the origin story of politics in the United States. The Mayflower Compact is like Peter Parker getting bit by that spider. At least, that is how it is often portrayed. So, for the rest of this episode, we are going to spend our time looking at the Mayflower Compact. I'm going to look at the compact from three different points of view. First, I'm going to look at the mythological agreement. I'm going to focus on the popular portrayal and how it is taught to those of us growing up in the United States. Second, I'm going to look at the actual document itself, what was included, and how it functioned. And then finally, I'm going to spend some time looking at just where the legend comes from. For those of us in the United States, the Mayflower Compact is something that we learn about when we are very young, and typically when we first learn about the Pilgrims. It is portrayed in many ways as the origin of American democracy. The story is typically taught that the Pilgrims, realizing the importance of representative government, decided to come together and form one that would function in the new land. The idea plays well into how Americans like to view themselves. As we had discussed back during Jamestown, the popular way that things are taught is that the Pilgrims came to the United States to escape persecution from tyranny. In that fashion, the Mayflower Compact fits very nicely into the story. The Pilgrims, escaping the tyranny of England, established an early constitution, steeped in the ideals of democracy. It flows very nicely into the American story, and it shows the Pilgrims from the very moment that they came across the Atlantic were doing so with the ideals of liberty in mind. They were coming here to escape despotism back at home, and to push for those freedoms and the democracy that was absent back home in England. The reality of the situation, however, is different. The Mayflower Compact is something that is born out of necessity in the moment. The colonists weren't thinking about it from the moment that they had left England, but rather they were reacting to landing in Cape Cod as opposed to at the mouth of the Hudson. The question therefore becomes twofold. What was the Mayflower Compact in reality, and what was its purpose? Once we have that established, we can begin to look at the actual importance of the compact in U.S. political history. The Mayflower Compact came to exist for several reasons, most of which we've already begun to talk about. The first situation that arose was from the decision to stop in Cape Cod. Without a patent to settle Cape Cod, the settlers aboard the Mayflower found it necessary to establish a charter. More importantly, however, the need for some kind of agreement grew out of the growing factionalism. 
Two groups ended up immigrating on the Mayflower, the Leideners and that group of strangers. Worrisome talks, especially amongst the strangers, had been spreading throughout the Mayflower with the decision to return to Cape Cod. Some of these rumblings, especially in regards to the Captain Christopher Jones, were becoming distressingly mutinous in nature. The Leideners made up just over one half the total group of the Mayflower. The Leideners were, without much of a question, a united block. The group of strangers, on the other hand, were far from it. Having recognized the importance of the entire group working together, they both knew that they needed to enter into some kind of an agreement with each other. The political unity of the Leideners meant that they were always going to be in the leadership positions within the colony. However, for the strangers, it at least meant that they had some kind of working relationship within that group. The strangers do seem to fully understand that their group had remained divided into the smaller factions. However, they also understood that the survival of the colony itself could be in question, not to say anything of the financial cost of being divided. Beliefs aside, working together or at least a basic level of mutual toleration and cooperation was going to be necessary. Under this backdrop of wanting to quickly get an agreement in place for the new settlement, both groups got together and hammered out what would become known as the Mayflower Compact. Despite not actually being on the Mayflower in many ways, the chief architect of the compact appears to have been the pastor John Robinson. Now, I must admit, I feel as though I should have probably introduced John Robinson by this point already. Robinson has been a key, though unnamed, part of our story since we were back in Scrooby. He was in many ways the de facto leader of the congregation and would remain in that position as they immigrated to Leiden. And while Robinson himself would not travel on the Mayflower, it is his guidance in his farewell address to those leaving on the Mayflower that seems to be the guiding light for the Leideners. In his letter, Robinson says, Lastly, whereas you are becoming a body politic, using amongst yourselves civil government, and are not furnished with any persons of special eminency above the rest to be chosen by you into office of government. Let your wisdom and godliness appear, not only in choosing such persons as you do entirely love and will promote the common good, but also in yielding unto them all due honor and obedience in their lawful administrations, not beholding them in their ordinariness of their person. By God's ordinance for your good. Not like the foolish multitude, who more honor the gay coat than either the virtuous mind of the man, or glorious ordinance of the Lord. But you know better things, and that the image of the Lord's power and authority, which the magistrate breed, is honorable in how it means a person serve. And this duty you both may, the more willing and ought, the more conscionable to perform. Because you are at least, for the present, to have only them for your ordinary governors, which yourselves shall make choice of for that work. The Leideners had been following Robinson for years, and even though he was not with them now, they were still determined to follow his words. Recall as well, if you're curious about why the Leideners had so much sway in the matter when they only made up a little less than half the Mayflower's passengers, it's because the Leideners were a united front. Don't be mistaken and think that the strangers in any way formed a group consensus. The Leideners were always going to vote as a single unified group. The strangers, on the other hand, represented a much larger cross-section with far more variability. It can be easy to believe that we are dealing with two united groups here, but instead we should look at it as though the strangers are not united at all, but rather they're just the denotation that they are outside of the Leidener group. The political cohesiveness of the Leideners allowed them to have more, though not complete, control over drafting the compact. While the original copy of the Mayflower Compact has been lost, we have a couple renditions of what the agreement said. The copies that we have are all basically the same, with only minor changes in the wording and spelling. For the sake of this podcast, I'm going to go ahead and use the one that was written down by William Bradford. I don't generally plan on reading entire historical documents into the podcast, but the Mayflower Compact is short enough that I figured that I would just go ahead and read the entire thing. From there, we can look at the different parts of it and what it all means. So, here it is, in its entirety, the Mayflower Compact. In the name of God, Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc. Having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, 
in honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these present solemnly and mutually, in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices, from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience." In witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the year of the reign of our sovereign lord, King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, Anno Domine, 1620. The first thing that you should take away from this is that the compact is actually very short. In fact, it is just 204 words. John Robinson's influence is plainly seen in the compact. Notice that both Robinson and the compact quote that language that we've seen earlier of form a civil body politic. The compact lays out the importance of organizing themselves, forming laws, and promoting the general good of the colony. In many ways, the Mayflower Compact reads more like a preamble to a bigger constitution. There are all the promises of forming a government, working together for the greater good and enacting laws. However, the compact is devoid of any specific details on what any of that actually means in reality. Nothing in the compact really deviated from the acceptable forms of government that you would find throughout towns in England itself. First, it was a method whereby some amount of control could be exerted over the group. Mutinous talks were going around, and it was probably a good idea for everybody to get some control over the situation pretty quickly. Likewise, the Mayflower was about to make landfall in a largely unknown area. Winter was coming, and supplies were running short. Had the group gotten off and split into non-cooperative factions, there's a very real chance that the group may not survive the winter. Regardless of their feelings towards one another, they all would have understood that they were going to have to depend on one another to survive. The compact would address all of this and would at least work to the extent that it bound all the parties to each other. At the same time, it was a pragmatic solution to give the group some kind of authority to land in Plymouth instead of their intended spot near the mouth of the Hudson. With the compact in place, the next decision was to decide who was going to lead the colony. In the original pattern, it was Christopher Martin who was appointed as governor of the colony. However, considering that the original pattern at this point had been essentially done away with, it was going to be necessary to elect a new governor. Martin was already an unpopular figure, and importantly, not one of the Leideners who, remember, now had a majority and who could vote for the governorship. Martin had originally been the governor of the Speedwell, but upon transferring to the Mayflower, appears to have taken the reins over that ship as well. There is no evidence that I was able to find that stipulated who would have been the governor of the Mayflower had the Speedwell managed to make the journey. Either way, however, Martin had never liked nor trusted the Leiden congregation. The Leideners had suspected that Martin was mismanaging the money, and Martin for his part did little to help his own cause when the Leiden congregation asked to see the financial records and Martin just flat out refused to open up the books. William Bradford writes on this failure to open the books that... Near 700 pounds hath been bestowed at Hampton upon what I know not. Mr. Martin says that he neither can nor will give any accounts of it, and if he be called upon for the accounts, he crieth out of unthankfulness, and his pains and tear, that we are suspicious of him and flings away and will end nothing. Also, he insults us over our poor people with such scorn and contempt, as if they are not good enough to wipe his shoes. It would break your heart to see his dealing and the mourning of our people. They complain to me, and alas, I can do nothing for them. If I speak to him, he flies in my face as mutinous, and says that no complaint shall be heard or received but by himself, and says that they are forward and waspish, discontent people, and I do ill to hear them. So yeah, Bradford is not exactly singing the praises of Martin here. And based on this, it really shouldn't be much of a surprise that the Lateraners were not going to balk at the chance to rid themselves of the problem that Christopher Martin had become. Combine that with the political cohesiveness and unity in voting, it follows that the Lateraners were going to be able to appoint one of their own as the governor. Sure enough, with the support of the Lateraners, John Carver was elected governor of the new colony. 
John Carver was a very important member of the Latin Church. Carver entered into the congregation through his marriage to Catherine White. However, quickly upon entering, he would become very close with Pastor Robinson and would quickly rise to one of the leading roles. If you recall, despite the fact that we focused more on Robert Cushman, John Carver was the other person that had gone to England to lead negotiations for the voyage in the first place. Evidence suggests that it was probably Carver who wrote the Mayflower Compact, and he certainly was the first one to sign it. This is a pretty strong indication that by this point Carver was one of the leading members of the group. With his involvement in planning the trip, his leading role amongst the Lighterners, and his position as the probable author of the Mayflower Compact, Carver proved to be a logical choice for the governorship. The Mayflower Compact, in reality, was not a break with the English. It wasn't some grand declaration of independence or a constitution. Rather, it was an instrument born out of necessity and pragmatism in a specific moment of time. Today, we have the benefit of hindsight. We know that New England is going to become the radical haven that the revolution emerges from. It's easy, and honestly, it fits the narrative well to force the Mayflower Compact into that paradigm. Doing so, however, puts an importance on the compact that is outside the actual realities of the document. The Mayflower Compact was not a revolutionary or enlightened break from the governments of the past, nor was it a great declaration of the power of democracy. The Mayflower Compact was instead an acknowledgement that if those aboard the Mayflower didn't cooperate and work together, they were running headlong towards catastrophe. If the Mayflower Compact then isn't this revolutionary document that we often think of it as today, the question becomes, why has it earned that reputation? It is that question that I'm going to focus on for the rest of today's episode. If we are seeing that the Mayflower Compact has been put a bit higher on the podium than it really deserves, the obvious question becomes, why? It wasn't really until the beginning of the Revolution that the Mayflower Compact becomes something noteworthy. A decade before the Revolution, John Adams wrote a series of articles which formed the basis of a quasi-history of thought and ideals in New England. In this document, Adams doesn't even make a single mention of the Mayflower Compact. This is especially noteworthy because Adams himself was one of the great-great-grandsons of John Alden, one of the signatories of the compact. One would think that had Adams found any relevant importance in the document, he would have found a way to link it to himself. We see the compact appear from time to time around the revolution on both sides. The British used the compact to show that the pilgrims were loyal subjects to the crown. In 1780, we see the compact used by the loyalist historian George Chalmers in his political annals of the present United Colonies. There he wrote that the pilgrims were loyal subjects of the crown and clung to the motherland to get through that first winter. Chalmers writes about how the pilgrims, speaking especially of the Leideners, stuck together in face of persecution from the strangers. The Leideners understood that their religion wasn't going to be enough to find prosperity and peace, and that it was their deep connection with the crown that would aid them in conjunction with their religion, and this would allow them to take control of their new home. And now Chalmers goes as far as to claim that the Leideners continually fell back on English laws, despite no requirement to as they had landed without a charter as it was their birthright. In other words, the Leideners were under no requirement to subscribe to English law. They had landed outside the legal patent. The laws of England did not apply here. However, the Leideners made the conscious decision to be loyal to the crown and ascribe to the laws of Britain. The Leideners chose to be subjects of the crown. Following the revolution, the compact had become a piece of British propaganda. The document was being portrayed as a type of social contract that the pilgrims had with the British, much more a conservative allegiance to the crown than a revolutionary statement. It was James Wilson and John Quincy Adams who are largely responsible for taking the compact back and turning it into something different altogether. Wilson, for his part, spent much of the later part of the 1780s and early 1790s using the compact as an example of democracy that was different than that prevailing in the French models. Specifically, both Wilson and later Quincy Adams wanted to move away from the dominant French political philosophy of the day. Both men wanted to move away from the social contract that had been proposed by Rousseau decades earlier. Now, just as a side note, if you're suddenly wondering why we care about what the French are thinking, do recall that in 1789, the French Revolution would kick off. It would grow during the early 1790s before peaking with the terror in 1793. For a young republic like the United States, there was genuine concern seeing where, small r, republicanism can lead. So, in a time where the French were basically horrifying everybody, 
Wilson was interested in moving the narrative away from the French version of democracy and something more in line with the ideals of John Locke. John Quincy Adams would pick up the mantle of Wilson and would continue to retake the narrative of the compact. After being asked to speak in Plymouth on Founder's Day, Quincy Adams led with the importance of the compact. Quincy Adams was interested in taking the compact and linking it back to the days of Anglo-Saxon England as something more pure. He described the Norman conquerors as being tyrants. In this move, he is able to connect the compact back to its English roots, hence moving it away from Rousseau, and yet at the same time, he manages to avoid linking it to something directly British in nature, obviously not wanting to give them that propaganda advantage back with the compact. Later, the Mayflower Compact is going to become a core piece of the Whigs' anti-Jacksonian rhetoric. We are going to cover all this in depth, so don't stress too much right now about this. I'm just trying to gloss over to give you an idea of what's going on. To sum all of this up, the simple answer is this. The Mayflower Compact finds its importance because different factions, both domestic and abroad, sought to use it as a tool of propaganda. The British wanted to use the compact for their own purposes, to show that the original pilgrims had actually been highly loyal supporters of the crown. The Americans, on the other hand, wanted to show that the pilgrims were something entirely different. The compact was used to argue for different types of democracy, specifically as a tool to distance the young nation from the French form of democracy that had ended up embroiling France in revolution. And then later it was used to rally against Jacksonianism. In short, the Mayflower Compact became currency in this war of propaganda. Throughout this process, the Mayflower Compact ended up becoming much more than it actually was in reality. The reputation remains to this day. The Mayflower Compact continues to sit in a position where it is often taught as being an early example of constitutionalism that is going to come to define the United States later on. The last several minutes of this podcast have basically been a sneak peek at what will make up a significant chunk of future seasons. So don't stress too much about following along with the different political views or the different political philosophy. This stuff is all incredibly interesting and truth be told is the driving force behind why I started this podcast in the first place. We are going to spend a ton of time talking about the political views in place right after the formation of the United States. In fact, I anticipate that we are going to spend nearly an entire season discussing these topics. So if you have absolutely no clue why the Whigs are anti-Jacksonian, just hang with me. I promise we're going to get there. Today was just a situation where I wanted to introduce where the mythology of the Mayflower Compact formed, and it required me to jump ahead a little bit in our story. The Mayflower Compact continues to stand as one of the key political documents in United States history. In so many ways, it is presented as that first shot in what would come to define New England as the revolution approached. However, the reality is that the compact itself was really something that was created to ensure some level of cooperation in the new colony and solve several of the problems that the passengers had found upon landing outside the patent. The compact is a testament to the cooperation of the groups that did not see eye to eye. However, the common survival trumped everything. As an opening salvo of radicalism in New England, the Mayflower Compact does fall short. The legend of the document isn't even born until the late 18th and early 19th century, when multiple sides attempted to seize on the compact for propaganda reasons. It is through this battle to control the narrative of what the Mayflower Compact actually meant that the compact itself is going to become part of the origin story of the future United States. And that is a position that it continues to hold up to this day and will likely continue to hold into the future. Next time, we are going to settle down in the new colony at Plymouth and look at what those first early years brought. So with that, I will see you back here in two weeks time when we usher our pilgrims off of the ship and onto the shores of Plymouth. Until then, I hope you have a fantastic two weeks and I appreciate all you who have taken the time to tune in and listen to this podcast. Thank you.